Thank you for joining me. On May 10th, 2016, the United States Food and Drug Administration's Center for Tobacco Products officially released regulations regarding vaporization technology. As they are written, the regulations enact a complete prohibition from sale any vapor products in the United States within two years. They basically make all vaporizers or electronic cigarettes illegal to sell anywhere in the United States unless those products are specifically approved by the government. Now, the federal government, through the FDA, has made no claims that the products are inherently unsafe and has not presented any scientific evidence that they're harmful and need to be banned from sale. In fact, most scientific evidence shows exactly the opposite, that smokers who switch to vaping improve their health significantly. A few weeks before the prohibition was announced, the Royal College of Physicians in London, England, released a study of vapor products called Nicotine Without Smoke, Tobacco Harm Reduction. Now, the Royal College of Physicians is one of the, has been one of the most respected medical groups in the world for 500 years. Uh, it was actually established in 1518 by King Henry VIII. And their report had the following conclusions that harm reduction has a huge potential to prevent death and disability from tobacco use and hasten our progress to a tobacco-free society. In normal conditions of use, toxin levels in inhaled e-cigarette vapor are probably well below prescribed threshold limit values for occupational exposure, in which case significant long-term harm is unlikely. Although it is not possible to precisely quantify the long-term health risks associated with e-cigarettes, the available data suggests that they are unlikely to exceed 5% of those associated with smoked tobacco products. In other words, vapor products are 95% safer than the traditional combustible tobacco products and probably even more safe than that. Nicotine from exhaled vapor can be deposited on surfaces, but at such low levels that there is no plausible mechanism by which such deposits could enter the body at doses that would cause physical harm. In other words, vapor products pose no secondhand smoke or secondhand exposure to bystanders. And finally, they said harm reduction provides an opportunity to improve the lives of millions of people. It is an opportunity that, with care, we should take. So in the UK, they are embracing the concept of tobacco harm reduction for smokers, but here in the United States, the government is rejecting it. The FDA's prohibition is achieved through a massive regulatory framework that does not treat vapor products like regular consumer products or even traditional tobacco products or even as a something new like a cigarette replacement. They treat it like pharmaceuticals and put them under the same approval framework. The regulations consist of a 500-page document that puts a nearly insurmountable hurdle on companies in order to obtain government approval for sale for their products. The FDA estimates that an application for a product will take a minimum of 1,500 hours to complete, and in addition, most industry analysts expect the application will cost nearly a million dollars per product. And none of this guarantees approval. The FDA is under no obligation to approve any products and certainly can reject all of them. Compliance with the government is set so high and so onerous and so expensive that only the biggest companies, in other words, in this case, the big tobacco cigarette companies, will have the money and resources to get through the FDA approval process. And most likely, 99.9% .9 of all vapor products on the market today will not be approved and will be banned from sale. And this regulation is actually not just for vapor products. The Center for Tobacco Products also released the same type of regulations for premium cigars and hookah as well. So what we could see is a complete government prohibition of, of the legitimate sale of vaporizers, premium cigars, and hookah. Now let me address one thing at the beginning here. This is not about kids. It's not about protecting kids. You don't need a 500-page regulation document to protect children. What you need uh, is just a one-sentence law that says you cannot sell vapor products to any person under the age of 18. 
much like what we do for alcohol. We have laws restricting, you know, with age restrictions for use. And I agree with the premise that the product should not be in the hands of minors and support all of the restrictions to that effect. There's already a federal law that says that mandates childproof caps for e-liquid, which is used with vaporizers and electronic cigarettes. But that's not what this is about. What the executive branch of the U.S. government is attempting to do is prohibit the legitimate sale of vapor and premium cigars and hookah to adults. Now, let me say that again. What the government wants to do is ban the sale of these products to adults. Now, as I will explain, the regulations are illogical. They ignore science. They pervert the entire effort to reduce the use of harmful combustible tobacco products and show an absolute failure of government regulatory policy. So first, on their face, the regulations seem illogical and absurd. So this is a vaporizer. It's made of metal and Pyrex glass and has a battery inside. Under the regulations, this would be labeled as tobacco. This is e-juice. This is the liquid that you would put inside the tank of the vaporizer. Now, the e-juice is a glycerin suspension made up of two ingredients, vegetable glycerin and propylene glycol, and flavoring. Now, it can contain liquid nicotine as well. What I'm holding in my hand, though, does not. This is called a zero. This has no nicotine at all, just the glycerin and flavoring. This is another brand of e-juice. Uh, and this company actually doesn't even put any propylene glycol in their e-juice. This is just vegetable glycerin and flavoring. Those are the only, only ingredients. However, under the regulations, this would be labeled as containing tobacco. So let's take a look at what the FDA regulations say. The alternative warning statement for products that do not contain nicotine, i.e. no nicotine at detectable levels, is revised to read, this product is made from tobacco. And let's take a look on the FDA's website. Uh, it says, if the tobacco product manufacturer submits a self-certification statement to FDA that the newly regulated tobacco product does not contain nicotine and the manufacturer has data to support this assertion, then the alternate, alternate statement must be used on the product packages and advertisements. This product is made from tobacco. So this bottle of e-juice that is, contains only a combination of vegetable glycerin and flavorings would have to have a label saying that it contains and is derived from tobacco. This is government mandated mislabeling of products and provides misinformation to the public. The FDA actually wants consumers to be told incorrect and inaccurate information about vaping products. The other components of vaporizers actually would also now be considered tobacco. For example, the battery. So this is a battery. This is called an 18650 battery. These were originally designed to be used in flashlights, but because they're very powerful, we use them in vaporizers. And uh, the way they work is that this is a typical um, vaporization device, and what you would do is take the battery and put it in, and then you can use the product. The battery would now be labeled as tobacco. This is wire. This is called Canthal A1 wire. It's the most common wire used as a heating element inside of the vaporizer. The wire is made, of a, made up of the elements iron, chromium, and aluminum. Under the FDA regulations, this would now be labeled as tobacco. This is cotton, organic Japanese washed cotton. It's one of the most common wicking materials that are used inside of modern advanced vaporizers. Under FDA regulations, cotton would now be labeled as tobacco. So let's take a look at the regulations and what they say. The following is a non-exhaustive list of examples of components and parts used with electronic nicotine delivery systems. And that's what they're calling them in this document, in the uh, regulations. E-liquids, atomizers, batteries, 
uh, cardamizers, digital displays or lights would now be labeled as tobacco. Flavors would be tobacco, uh, the vials that contain e-liquids would be tobacco, and software, programmable computer software, if it is related to these devices, would now be labeled as tobacco. And what I find curious <laughs> is do these products that are now labeled as tobacco retain that designation in other applications? So for example, the batteries. If the, you know, now if we use the battery in a flashlight, does it still retain its tobacco designation? So now we have the surprising innovation of tobacco powered flashlights. So when Congress passed the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act uh, in 2009, did they direct the FDA to mislabel products? Well, no. In fact, there's a section called misbranded tobacco products, and in it, the law states that tobacco products should not have labeling that is false or misleading and should show accurate contents as to the amount of tobacco present in the product. So it's clearly not the intention of the law to have products mislabeled and the public deceived. But if you're pursuing a policy of prohibition, then you can't accurately describe how good the products are or how they're not tobacco because then why are you banning it? So part of the problem here is that the 2009 Family Smoking Prevention Act that the FDA is using to justify their regulations w never mentions vapor or vaporizers or electronic cigarettes or any electrical devices at all. The regulations were written uh, focusing on limiting the use and protecting the public from harmful combustible tobacco products. And so the FDA regulations are basically made up. The FDA is usurping their power over these products and was never given specific authority over them through direct statute. Now the rules do not include a lot of items that you think would be necessary for good product regulation. There are no uniform safety standards. There are no manufacturing standards. There is no description of what good manufacturing processes would be. There is no description of how the science says that some products are better than others. And there is nothing from the FDA regulations that show how, they would, how the regulations would be impacting the public's health. Uh, in fact, over and over again in the regulations, the FDA indicates it does not have sufficient data about vapor products to know how it would impact the public health. So admittedly, the government is regulating based on insufficient data. But what the regulations do have in abundance are very, very strict regulations on how manufacturers and retailers can advertise the products. Of course, if the manufacturers and retailers were able to uh, truthfully explain the products, then again, the prohibition wouldn't make any sense. So for example, the zero nicotine e-juice. The government does not want you to actually advertise and explain how this product does not contain tobacco because it has a warning label on it saying it does contain tobacco, even though it doesn't. You have retailers uh, you know, advertising uh, a tobacco-free tobacco product, which of course wouldn't make any sense. So let's take a look at the regulations. Um, the restrictions on advertising, the first part of it here, says that they are restricting the vapor manufacturers and vapor retailers from comparing a vapor product to a traditional combustible product in a way in which the public would think that the vapor product is safer or less harmful. The restriction, the advertising restrictions also say, and this is the very last line, you cannot advertise what a product contains or is free of. In other words, again, they don't want the retailers or manufacturers to be describing these products as tobacco free, even though they are tobacco free, because they're carrying a label that says that it contains tobacco. And this is for the zero nicotine eaters. So what's going on here? <laughs> what is the FDA's philosophy uh, regarding vapor products? Uh, how come none of this seems to make any sense? Well, buried about halfway through the regulations uh, in this 500-page document, they actually come out and explain their philosophy. And so here it is. For the purposes of this deeming regulation, FDA does not believe that it is necessary to distinguish between vapor products and combusted products. So it considers vapor products and traditional combustible cigarettes to be the same. They're trying to intentionally confuse the public. 
And I think the best way we can describe this is that that statement is scientifically inaccurate. Once again, this is not what Congress intended by the original legislation, the 2009 Family Smoking Prevention Act. If you look at the act, it clearly says that the FDA must consider scientific evidence when it's regulating. So vegetable glycerin is not tobacco. And when you heat vegetable glycerin into a vapor, it is not smoke. But in trying to establish a regime of prohibition based on a scientific falsehood, the FDA has produced a set of regulations that are illogical, absurd, and intentionally misinform the consumer. But it actually gets worse. So let's go a little bit deeper into the rabbit hole. Smoking tobacco cigarettes is the leading form of preventable death and disease in the United States. The number the government uses is that more than 480,000 people die each year from smoking cigarettes. Under these new regulations, deadly combustible cigarettes will completely escape any additional regulation or sales restrictions. All aspects of what many consider to be the most harmful consumer product ever manufactured and sold will remain the same and completely untouched. So what does FDA regulation of cigarettes look like? So this is a pack of USA cigarettes as they are legally sold in the United States and FDA approved. On the pack, there is very little information. There are no ingredients. There is no nutritional information, no caloric information, all the normal things you would see on most food or drug products. In fact, there's not even any indi indication of how much nicotine is in this product. The main product that is killing people is allowed to continue to be sold unabated, while the less harmful alternative that does not produce tar and can completely eliminate secondhand smoke faces 500 pages of governmental regulations. Just a few weeks before the regulations were released, a study funded by the FDA, by their National Institute on Drug Abuse, found that the evidence suggests a strong potential for vaporized nicotine product use to improve population health by reducing or displacing cigarette use in countries where cigarette prevalence is high and smokers are interested in quitting. The authors found that studies indicate that most smokers use vaporized nicotine products with the intention of quitting smoking cigarettes. They also warned that countries whose policies discourage vaporized nicotine product use run the risk of neutralizing a potentially useful addition to methods of reducing tobacco use. However, the FDA has chosen to ignore its own science while deadly tobacco cigarettes face no regulation or sales restrictions, no additional regulation or sales restrictions, the must, much less harmful alternative faces prohibitive overregulation. The second point is that these regulations pervert tobacco control and harm reduction efforts because they empower the big tobacco companies. On the same day of the introduction of the regulations, Mitchell Zeller, the head of the FDA's Center for Tobacco Products, appeared on PBS to defend his department's new rules. He was asked about empowering the big tobacco companies, and you'll see in this clip he doesn't deny it and, in fact, tries to dodge the question and change the subject. Um, let's take a look. So the industry is also pushing back, as expected, and saying, look, the fees and the process and the structure you have for the applications is going to essentially close down some of those small businesses and small manufacturers, and it's essentially going to protect the big tobacco companies that have shifted, and you're really going to be giving them an advantage over the long haul. This is a public health issue. Beyond these cigarettes, we're also talking about the need to regulate cigars. Every single day, more teenage boys light up a cigar for the first time then light up a regular cigarette. So between cigars and e-cigarettes, we have a lot of work to do to protect kids from the harms of tobacco products. No. No, I'm sorry, Mr. Zeller, I completely disagree. I do not agree that empowering multinational big cigarette, tobacco cigarette companies is good for public health. 
he didn't deny it and he changed the subject because he knows his department is turning the vaporization market over to R.J. Reynolds and Philip Morris and British American Tobacco. And Wall Street agrees. Wells Fargo Securities notes that regulation of the e-cig vapor industry is broadly positive for the big tobacco manufacturers since it will increase the barriers to entry and likely entrench them even further. The Stifle Investment Group says, we believe their FDA regulations will thwart new product innovation from many small companies and favor the large tobacco companies. Now in the clip he talked about cigars. And first of all, it is currently federally illegal to sell cigars to anybody under the age of 18. But I think if there's one thing we can all agree on, it's that premium cigars are totally adult products. Now, I don't really smoke cigars, but I think an adult should be able to go purchase one if they want. Mr. Mr. Zeller actually did talk about protecting teenagers, and that's something I agree with. But do you know what the number one abused drug of teenagers actually is? Alcohol. The FDA has a sister agency in the Department of Health and Human Services called the Office of Adolescent Health. And they note that more adolescents drink alcohol than smoke cigarettes or use marijuana. Nearly four in 10 high school seniors report drinking some alcohol within the past month, and more than two in 10 report binge drinking within the past two weeks. Drinking endangers adolescents in multiple ways, including motor vehicle crashes, a leading cause of death for this age group. And so, since alcohol is the number one abused substance of teens in the United States, the federal government has decided to prevent adults from purchasing vaporizers and cigars. In releasing these regulations, the United States Food and Drug Administration has produced an illogical and absurd set of rules that perversely empowers and protects the country's big tobacco cigarette companies. It cripples innovation of vaporization technology. The regulations on e-liquid intentionally mislabel the products and misinform the public. It ignored much of the available science. The FDA even ignored its own science. But perhaps the government's biggest failure is that these prohibitionary tactics will create a black market. Now, I can't predict the future, but how could it not? These are really good products, and they work really well. Demand for them will not just vaporize because the government bans it. It's estimated that the vaporization market is between three and a half and four billion dollars. That is just not going to, a four billion dollar industry is just not going to disappear. Where do you think it's going to go? I think the conscious and deliberate creation of a black market through overregulation is a monumental failure of government. The black market doesn't care about safety or good manufacturing practices or labeling or age restrictions. Creating a black market for any product should be avoided at all costs because illicit markets bring crime and violence and a host of unintended and unwanted consequences. Black markets are completely uncontrollable and we'll have no idea what's going on. Now, the FDA does address the concern of the creation of black market in its rules document, and their response was that they would step up enforcement efforts if need be. But is this really what we want to do as a society? To employ law enforcement resources against adults to prevent them from using a product that can help them stop smoking? I mean, <laughs> that doesn't even make a little bit of sense. You know, back in 1914, one of America's most brilliant minds, Thomas Edison, was one of the first people to recognize the dangers of smoking cigarettes. And even though there was very little science done at the time, he identified the toxin acrolin as being a byproduct of uh, burning tobacco cigarettes. But Edison was a scientist and obviously believed in technology as a way to improve humanity. I think he would be appalled 
that the government is now restricting vaporization technology, yet allowing combustible tobacco cigarettes, proven killers, to be sold unabated. Dr. Michael Siegel, a physician at the Boston University School of Public Health and someone who has uh, fought for tobacco control for 25 years, says of the FDA regulations, this is going to be a disaster for public health. So on many, many levels, the FDA's regulations on vaping make terrible public policy. By prohibiting the legal sale of potentially life-saving vaporization technology to adults, the Food and Drug Administration's Center for Tobacco Products has failed the American people. Thank you.